What you need to understand is this is not like a fence in a backyard. This is it. This is a wall, but it's also an entire architecture, an entire ecosystem and infrastructure around it. Hey guys, I'm Eric Olson, and welcome to another episode of the Science Centric Podcast. One of the most polarizing political issues of the day is President Trump's proposed border wall. An executive order he signed in 2017 calls for a contiguous physical wall or other impassable barrier along the entire U.S.-Mexico border. The idea being that an unbroken, impassable wall would help deter illegal immigration and drug trafficking. According to a visual survey by USA Today, only about 650 miles of the nearly 2,000-mile border is fenced. About half of that fencing can stop people on foot. The other half only prevents vehicles from crossing. Trump supporters see the wall as a necessary step to secure our borders and protect our national sovereignty. Critics see it as ineffective, xenophobic, and even racist. What we hear less about is how such a wall would impact the creatures whose range crisscrosses the border. A 2017 study by professors at the National Autonomous University of Mexico found 841 species would be affected by a large and passable barrier. What's more, Trump's wall would cut through several important ecosystems and centers of biodiversity, like the Sonoran Desert and the National Butterfly Center. In this episode, I spoke with John Platt, editor of the environmental news website The Revelator. John and other writers for the site have covered this issue extensively since the Revelator launched in 2017. We talked about which species would be affected by the wall, if there are other ways to protect our border that would be less intrusive, and how likely it is for Trump's magnus opus to ever see completion. John, welcome to the Science Centric Podcast. So glad to have you on. Glad to be here, Eric. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Um, so I guess to start, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the Revelator, yeah. uh, if I'm saying that correctly. And, you are. <laughs> and how did it begin? How did you get involved with it? Yeah. And um, you know, what is the mission of the Revelator? Right. Well, the Revelator, which of course is at therevelator.org, is an environmental news and ideas site. We publish pretty much every day. We've been publishing for about two years and, and we've done about 400 stories so far on climate change, endangered species, the border wall, public lands, things like that. We are um, published by, but editorially independent from the Center for Biological Diversity. I'd been interviewing people from the center for more than a decade and I knew that they were great folks. And they came to me a little after the Trump election and said, hey, we, you know, we think we should put our money into a new journalistic outfit. And it seemed like a really great opportunity and a great time. I mean, a lot of environmental publications had gone under. A lot of news desks had, had closed down. And um, I'd been freelancing for 10 years. I was looking to do something a little bit different. This came up at the right time. And I said, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. So our goal is not to you know, just be a daily news site, just, you know, hey, here's what happened, but to go a little bit deeper. Um, revelator is a word that you know, it means truth teller someone who reveals the truth. So we're trying to get a little bit deeper, get a little bit more context to help people understand what's going on, and really a little bit more high end, trying to actually publish material that can be used by conservationists, by by government officials, by people who are act, uh, really active activists to do a better job of conservation. Um, do you think that there, I mean, is there a lack of environmental news in general? That, well, that something like this was needed? I, I think there's an awful lot of it. I think the environmental journalism is fairly strong. Um, I think that there, we are filling a niche. Um, we really try to tell stories that aren't being told in other places, and there's never enough time to tell all the stories that aren't being told. Um, so, yeah, I think that there is there is a definite niche that we're filling, um, and, and more can be out there, definitely. Okay, great. And just for our audience, um, you've you've written for the Extinction Countdown blog for a really yeah. long time, and that that's a place that they may know your writing from. Yeah, um, yeah. And could you and and that's been rolled over to the Revelator, right? Um, could you just talk a little bit about that and 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 what yeah. you cover there? 
Yeah, Extinction Countdown is something I started on my own. Um, and eventually it was picked up first by Plenty Magazine, which went out of business, and then ran in Scientific American for a number of years. It's a, a news column covering the science and politics of endangered species. So I've written about well over a thousand. I think I stopped counting at a thousand species. Oh, wow. Um, and there have definitely been a lot more since then. So it used to be I'd do two or three a week. Now it's more like two or three a month or a lot more in depth. But it is one of the core components of the Revelator. And again, we're just looking at what's going on in the world. I try to cover, sadly, every extinction. Um, and then, you know, the really big news. And I try to mix it up. I'm not just doing your megafauna, your rhinos and your lions and your polar bears, but I'll do plants and, and insects and the whole anything. And, and I hope that in the process I can reveal the, the, the underlying causes of extinction and the, the extinction crisis. So talk about what's really going on and give people lessons and illustrations. And, and, and per, perhaps more importantly, talk to the people who are working really hard to try to turn things around and tell their stories, uh, because I think that really resonates with, with people. Mm-hmm. And this is this is a little bit off topic, but I I always ask this of environmental journalists, which is how do you not get depressed writing about things like extinctions because you oh, you tough. have to write you know you yeah, you're, it, you're covering something that's seems to be kind of a worsening situation and and hopefully that won't always be the case, but but. How do you keep a positive attitude, I guess? It's a tough job. I mean, I, I speak to a lot of conservationists, and they have the same problem. Um, a lot of them experience PTSD-like symptoms because they've gone and, you know, they've been studying species for a long time. They go back, the whole population is wiped out, or a species is gone despite their efforts. Um, honestly, talking to the, the people who are making a difference, who are working really hard to try to prevent extinction, is the thing that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if I, if I really hit a, like... Just over the past month, we've had the news about the Trump administration trying to take wolves off the Endangered Species Act. And then we had the news about the vaquita, which is down to 10 individuals probably. Um, and those hit me hard because I've been writing about both these species for a long time. So what did I do? I mean, I just had to walk away from the computer, take a long walk outside. Or, you know, you got to practice self-care. But right. Yeah, and then you look to the successes. As an environmental journalist, it can't be all doom and gloom. You got to say, what's going on? What's the progress? Where are we making um, a positive change? And tell those stories too. And that helps keep a little balance in me as a journalist too. Yeah, and I, I, I assume that it's good to get those stories out as well because they're, um, you know, it's important to, to for people to see what's been successful because maybe I can apply that in my community or to exactly. a species that affects me locally or something like right. that. Right, yeah, yeah, totally true. Or you can just understand, okay, it's not just the world's worst thing in the world. People are doing something about it. I don't, I don't, if you get so negative, you can just say, well, there's, you can throw your hands up. There's nothing <laughs> I can do about it. So I'm going to give up. I'm just going to use all the plastic I want, uh, you know. So you can show people that it's not, the world's worst thing. It's pretty awful. <laughs> it's pretty awful. Yeah. But, you know, you don't have to give people, you can give people a lifeline here and there too. Right. Um, yeah. And, and just don't read any stories about plastics and, and you'll feel, <laughs> you'll feel better, I think. But uh, anyways, there you um, go. <laughs> so, um, so the, the, I just wanted to d delve a little bit into the relationship with CBD yeah. Uh, Center for Biological Diversity. I actually have a personal connection to that. My sister actually interned oh, wow. uh, there as a, as a law student. Um, so, yeah, it feels feels very close in a way. But um, do you, I mean, w when you say it's editorially independent, I mean, do you yeah. do, do they just count on you to sort of find the stories that you want to cover as the editor? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and yeah. they're, you know, you're not... They're not saying, oh, you have to cover this or... They don't tell me really what to cover. cover. They, they might make suggestions here and there. Hey, you know, hey, we know these people are doing this thing. Um, but they don't review the stories before they're published. They don't uh, They don't tell me I can or can't publish, or, you know, cover certain topics. What I do do is try, you know, if the center, they, they're so involved in so many different things, but if they're working on five different things, well, what's the sixth thing that they're not looking at? That might be something I can do. Or maybe those five things have something in common. Maybe I can pull back and look at that big picture stuff instead of just looking at this, you know, one little slice of things. And that, I think, um, pr ends up resulting in some good storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I always find it's uh, nice to have access to, you know, experts that are sort of on the ground and, yeah. you know, 
um, intimately involved because as a journalist or, you know, you can't do that yourself. Obviously it's difficult. I mean, you can, but, but you know, it's costly. And, and so, yeah, I think that's great that you have that. uh, Yeah. And I can always turn, yeah. And I can always turn to anyone at the center and say, Hey, can you give me some background on this? Am I really looking at this the right way? Is there any nuance I'm missing? And that's, that's an invaluable resource. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty sweet gig overall though. It's it's not bad. (laughs) Great. Um, one issue that the revelator has covered in depth is yeah. Trump's border wall, the, this giant wall that he plans on building along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, what broadly are the concerns of environmental scientists when it comes to this wall? And, sure. And I know that's a big topic, so but we can it delve is. into certain aspects of it. But I, I yeah. just, you know, broadly, maybe you could give an overview of that. Well, there, there are a number of things, but one of the most pressing things is it's going to interfere with the migration of animals, whether they're, they're traveling long distances or they're just, they're just, maybe they just have a really small range, but it's going to go right through their habitat. And that's going to either just prevent them from, from moving with the seasons or cut off populations on either side of the wall so they don't have that genetic diversity to keep going. You can end up with populations that just shrink over time because they don't have that influx of new genes and material. Mm-hmm. Um, you've also got a lot of ecological effects of the, of the wall itself. It, it cr- creates erosion. It blocks uh, water, so you're going to get flooding. Um, we, are, we have a lot of sewage that transfers back and forth between the U.S. and Mexico that's going to interfere with that. So, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of impacts out from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, is that true, whether it's, you know, a big concrete wall or it's, A wall, like I've seen some demo walls, I guess you would call them, that are more like metal slats. Would 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 that have the same sort of impact? Is one better or worse than the other? Well, what you need to understand is this is not like a fence in a backyard. You know, if you look in my neighborhood, you've got you know all these backyards and all these fences right next to each other, and the yards and the plants go right up against the fence, and rabbits like can go underneath the fence in my backyard and everything. Um, this is, this is a wall, but it's also an entire architecture, an entire ecosystem and infrastructure around it. So they're clearing on either side of the wall, hundreds of feet because you need to be able to see, you want to be able to see if anyone's coming up to them. You need to be able to maintain it. Uh-huh. So you've got vehicles traveling up and down all the time. You've got lights, you've got sounds and klaxons and machinery. You've got, um, generators, um, you've got armed machinery, you know, guns, um, it, it's, it becomes a thing where the people are traveling through this all the time. Right now, they're building a wall, a section of the wall in a wildlife reserve in Texas, and they have just bulldozed huge swaths of habitat to build this thing. Uh-huh. So, you know, this is not just a wall. It is everything that goes around it. And, yeah, you, you know, that means you've got everything from, from roadkill or just it make, makes it, the, you know, you're not going to want to go near that, and that's going to separate uh animals from the plants they need or, or just rem, you know bulldoze those plants that they need to survive for shelter or for food um and it just it creates a completely inhospitable environment for for animals now yeah certain there might be certain aspects of it you might if slats okay maybe the birds can or the bugs can fly through them or whatever maybe certain animals can cross but it's still not ideal yeah so that's and, i mean that's really interesting i, I it's almost you know, like thinking about it more like a, a roadway or, or a, yeah. a, a throughway. And I don't think a lot of people think about it that way. They think maybe like, I don't think na- they do. Nature is going to go right up to that wall and, you know, and, 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 and it would interfere, but it's not, but that, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting aspect. And, and we know that roads really fragment, uh, habitats yeah. for animals, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, um, some animals don't even like to walk on hardly pressed down surfaces and so maybe they're not going to be able to walk all that well or maybe they're just hey I could go over there and the plants 100 100 feet away or this you know it's going to change their patterns Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah it's it's a rough deal what sort of habitats and ecosystems are found along the U.S. uh, Mexico border I don't think that a lot of people think of it as a particularly biodiverse area having just 
flown from New York to Mexico City over a lot of it. It looks very, oh, wow. yeah, it looks very deserty, uh, yeah. particularly, I think maybe we we're flying over like the Chihuahua region. Uh, you know, what, what, what ecosystems are of the most concern there? Yeah. Well, it's actually a quite varied ecosystem. You've got rivers, you've got mountains, you've got some places that are quite lush and other places that appear to be less so. I mean, I would argue that most deserts to the human eye appear fairly bleak and inhospitable, but there's an awful lot of stuff that lives there. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just come out at night when it's a little bit more uh, pleasant for their, for their walking around or flying around. So I don't think we see quite as much, but anytime I've been in the desert, you poke around, you see that there's actually an awful lot of life. And, you know, there's a lot of camouflage, so maybe they're just not as visible. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the scientists I spoke to have cataloged in the range of 10,000 species that live in this area. Wow. And they said that some of the some of the places, there's actually a lot of human development around this border on either side. So, there, you know, maybe there's not a lot left. But there are some places, that they said some places are so biodiverse, it's like going to a zoo. There's so much wildlife there. Wow. And, um, you know... So you've got some places like the National Butterfly Center in Mission, Texas, which is one of the places the border wall is going through. They've got, obviously, butterflies. It's in their name. But they have all kinds of other stuff that lives there, the turtles. And, and the most recently, they've, they've had some people out there studying bees and finding the most incredible, di diverse range of bees. And these things are, you know, they don't, they might only live in a couple hundred feet. They don't need they don't go any further. So you, uh -huh. you race through that, that, that species or that population at least is gone. Oh wow! So yeah, there's there, you look, you look beneath the surface, you're going to find an awful lot. Um, I know that one particularly rich region is the Sonoran desert. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? I don't think most people are familiar with the Sonoran desert and, um, I actually, I feel a bit embarrassed. I'm from the West Coast and I've been to the Baja Peninsula even and I didn't really yeah. know that much about it. But but that's another area that would be bisected by a border wall, correct? Yeah, yeah. And that's an incredibly diverse region. Um, I've been there a couple of times. The center has, that's where their headquarters is. It's in Tucson, right? Oh. On the edge of the, the Sonoran Desert. And it, there's just, it's lush. It's a desert, but there's plants and wildlife everywhere you look. It's really quite something, and uh, it's really mountainous, and you get, you get a fair amount of rain at certain times of the year, so things bloom like crazy. It's uh, and and that's one of the places where you, we actually have one, a couple of the few jaguars that are found in the United States yeah. that have been slowly. Um, extending their range they were extirpated in the u.s they were all killed off and they were left left in mexico so the couple have been slowly coming back over the border and you know there's the chance for jaguars to be recovered in the sonoran desert in the mountains there um but if we put that wall up that's it <laughs> yeah 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 well yeah i did want to talk about jaguar i mean i think uh Jaguars are really interesting, and yeah. it does seem like that would be a species that would really be affected no matter what kind of wall that you put in. Yeah. Um, whether it has because they're so big, I mean, I was looking, yep. I was uh, in advance of our conversation, I was looking how big some of these <laughs> jaguars get, and I think some oh, of the yeah. males like there was a record male that was like 354 pounds. I was like, Holy that is cow. insane. But, but they're That's just massive, huge creatures. But I think most people associate jaguars with the jungle, right. uh, South American jungle. And, you know, uh, apparently they, they range up into the U S and yeah. Yeah. They, and, and like any big cat or any big predator that, that size, you know, you need you have a large range. It takes you a large, lot amount of land to find enough food, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just to feed that body, to feed 360 pounds. <laughs> so they're traveling all the time, and um, you know, if when when um, when they when they when they have little jaguars, and those little jaguars come of age, they disperse from their adult population, so they get further and further away. So you need, the more you have, the more room you need in order to keep them from getting into conflict with each other. Right. And they, they'll follow 
the the wildlife through the seasons up and up north and south. You know, they'll go with the migratory flows, and you it, you know you could, you put the wall up, you're going to block them from from following their food essentially uh, as part of it, and or you're going to block them, you're going to cut them off from each other. You're going to end up with a couple or maybe just a couple males on the on the U.S. side. Well, they're not going to reproduce, or maybe right. there's only one man, one, one male, one male, one female. Yeah. That's not going to create a healthy population. Just one other thing on the jaguar and talking yeah. about healthy populations. I know that like for big predators like that, when they when those populations become fragmented, they can often it can often lead to like genetic problems with yeah, breeding totally. and things like that. And I don't know if that'd be an issue for the jaguar, but I can imagine it probably would. It pro- um, you know we've we've seen it obviously with the Florida panther. Um, you know, they're you know the, most of the panthers now have these kind of crooks in their tails that are a sign of a genetic problem. Um, and it would probably take a few generations if there were enough to even have successive breeding. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it could definitely happen once once if once a, a mutation that gets introduced into the system, if there's no new genes coming in, then that mutation just keeps mutating. <laughs> keeps, spreading. <laughs> keeps spreading, yeah. Yeah. It just or or yeah, I mean it it's yeah. maybe and it, the, and the, yeah, go ahead. And the lower genetic diversity you have, it could not could maybe it's not just mutations, maybe it means you're everyone in the population is susceptible to the same disease uh so one disease could come through and wipe everyone out but if you have a genetically diverse population you have a healthy population that can withstand various things and different people have different immun- different animals have different immunities so you can survive right problems like that yeah i mean that's a that's a very good argument for biodiversity in general i, I exactly I think. Yeah, yeah 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 for sure one thing that that i've been giving a lot of thought to and and i'm very much a sort of technology buff and Mm -hmm. i i I, i'm hoping and praying that um and i'm not religious but i've been praying about this um that uh you know technology will be able to solve a lot of these ecological problems we have Mm -hmm. and i know they've been like for example using drones uh to help monitor endangered wildlife and and to stop poaching and things like that but is is there a technological solution here that would be that would sort of fulfill that requirement of border security and at the same mm-hmm. time not interfere with the the ecosystem? I've read some things, and there's potential. Drones have potential. You can put heat-seeking cameras on them, uh, so you, they can be used at night or identify people. You can write algorithms theoretically so that if something turns up on camera, it and it is a jaguar the the computer system can okay that's a jaguar no oh, oh no no that's a person um you can put sound machinery you know sound uh, sensing machinery out there again you need an entire infrastructure around that type of technology um i would almost argue that better technology is long before the border makes sure, you know if you really consider immigration a problem, and there are a lot of people who say that immigration is is at an all-time low, it's not really the, the problem that people perceive it to be, create the systems within Mexico and the United States that encourage healthy, legal immigration, um, that encourage the, the pe- – Take uh, refugees and make make sure they're processed in, in the right way. Make sure people have the economic. Out- you want to come to work U.S. for a job? Okay, here's how to make it easy. Mm-hmm. You want to go back? Mm-hmm. Here's how to make it easy. Right. I think that's the better solution is to is to to take these technologies and 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 the government systems and improve them rather than just trying to be out there and monitor wildlife. I mean, you also, if you're looking at the drug trade, then maybe we, it, that's not coming over by foot. That's coming underneath in, in the tunnels once in a while. But mainly it's coming over in big tanker trucks with, hidden with other products. So develop better technology to, to sense that stuff out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the sort of illegal immigration issue might be a little bit beyond the scope of my yeah. podcast. Yeah. But I do think... You know, there is certainly a segment of our of the U.S. population that feels that it's like a, a, a real priority and a real issue. Sure. Yeah. And but so what just... I'm thinking is, you know, is there some kind of technological solution that would kind of appease everybody? Yeah. Rather than that... than than putting up a big wall that that has these potential environmental yeah. effects. Yeah. And and the people I've spoken to that are dealing with with poachers in Africa, for instance, they are working on systems that can you can put cameras out. And and theoretically, just it's still in development, but it's getting better and better. 
be able to detect motion, be able to detect what's going through, and then be able to prioritize what signals are being sent to the people who are monitoring that. So you have a quick response team. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I think that's the future, is being just being able to put up remote cameras that are networked and um, and using computer algorithms to identify what's what, what's walking through that that camera's eyesight. Yeah. And uh, and then then be able to out, you know to send someone out rather than just having something something manned twenty four seven on a wall and yeah and horns and lights and and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean it. It seems like for you know the 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 most advanced technologically you know culture country in the world that we could come up with something a little better than a big you know concrete yeah. wall I yeah. don't know you think so you think <laughs> but that that requires thought and technology and development and pro you know so yeah. yeah i mean the wall seems simpler to a lot of people yeah and i and i and i definitely think that there's a symbolic component to it oh sure that that it's like we're putting a wall here and it's something that everyone can understand. And, and you talk about drones and heats, you know, heat and sensing like, cameras hmm. and they go, Hmm, I don't get it. You know, that kind of, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, that actually made me think about something and I don't know if this is something that you've looked into, but we, there is actually a precedent for this and there is a big wall that separates, you know, the Palestinian territory from Israel. Right. Do you know of any studies that have looked at wildlife there? Is it as much of an issue? I don't know if that region as, is as biologically diverse as the area that we're talking I, about. I haven't looked into that as much. That is a very good question, and I think it would be worth studying, um, you know, but that wouldn't be a 1,200-mile wall either. So, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's a little bit more homogenous probably than uh you know the the region that we're talking about, the Mexican border. Right. Um but yeah, I think that I think that would be interesting to to look at and, and just the yeah. you know, even if they're even if we're talking about smaller animals that you know, aren't as far ranging, just how that's impacted them. So I yeah. just, I just gave you I, a, your next article. All idea. right. I look forward <laughs> to researching that, but there, there are a ton of other studies about walls all around the world. And we know that they do impact species and wildlife and, and migration and flow and genetic flow and, and just, um, plant pollination and everything under the sun. So yeah. this is, this is kind of a unique situation, but it's also not, there's an awful lot of science that's been done over the years to show the, the dramatic impact of walls and borders. And uh, I even, you know, there's in Kazakhstan, they've got this great species called the Saiga and, um, you know, they, they have walls to, to stop to, for, for livestock purposes, for cattle. And the, the, you know, you try to jump over the wall, you get tangled, you get, you die, you know, this is, this is, a uh, We've seen it all over the time, all over the place. Yeah, and you're you're referring to the the Saiga antelope that sort of yes. strange has a strange looking ele elephant elephant looking nose. I think. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. I think we talked a little bit about the different kinds of species that would be affected, but are there yeah. are there some that are really notable that that could put a, a face on this issue? Yeah. In, in terms of. You know, it's things that people might rec recognize. We talked about the jaguar, but what the else? Jaguar. Like, what what well, are the animals? Uh, uh, I'd really encourage people to go to the Revelator and look at my article on the my articles on the National Butterfly Center. The, the diversity there, the butterflies and the bees that they found are just astonishingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've also got things like black bears. Oh, wow. You know, a lot of people don't think, that, but they, they go back and forth between the border. You can end up sep getting them separated. We've got a piece coming up. They, they, the black bears used to be extirpated. Oh, they were wiped out in Texas, and they came back, and they're recovering, and they're a protected species in Texas. But that could be a problem if the border wall comes through. Um, you've got a lot of birds, a lot of really fantastic birds that could affect their – where they – they, you know, they're migrating huge distances and they, they've, they've planned for a long time to stop in this one spot for food. Um, oh, the food's gone. What do we do now? Um, so, yeah, there, there's an awful lot. But I think the jaguar and the bear are some of the most iconic things that we're going to see some really striking different, striking changes. And then there's a lot of species that just have these really small habitats, like the bees. Uh, the photographs of these bees are just – they're astonishingly beautiful. They're not your, just your, your typical honeybee. It's just this incredible biodiverse region with a lot of little microhabitats that create a lot of 
species that don't have huge ranges, but they're really remarkable. Yeah, I remember, I, I think I saw an article on the site on the Revelator talking about a uh, bee species that looked sort of lobster-like. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. I yeah, haven't heard, yeah, of, heard of that yeah, before. Yeah, like big claws or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so some really unique looking creatures. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, and then I guess also, you know, when you talk about those large predators, um, and, and we've seen this in Yellowstone, when you remove the large predators, predators it has these sort of follow-on effects through the environment so people may go right. oh, well you know jag jaguars have been removed so you know we're not big deal right but but that can that can have sort of a, a ripple down effect in through the right. system right yeah their their prey species can then become more abundant and as the as the and those are probably vegetarians herbivores so they start eating everything around them so you end up with this cascading effect um, yeah, and you can end up with a really degraded ecosystem as a result. Yeah. And as the, pl as the plants disappear because the herbivores are eating them, that can affect water flows, and you know that switch can affect us. So, right. Right. yeah. Maybe a good place to end is to talk about where we are currently with the, the wall, as yeah. it were. And yeah. I know that there was a lot of uh, stuff going on around the wall in terms of the government shut down and all this kind of stuff going on. And, um, you know, w what's going on now and, and how likely is it that, you know, Trump's border wall will get built before he leaves office, hopefully right. in, in two years. Um, this, yeah. is, this is not a nonpartisan podcast, so I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, how, um, I mean, how likely do you think that this will act actually happen and have these ecosystem effects that we're talking about? Well, some of it's happening right now. Yeah. Some of, some of the wall, the existing wall has been rebuilt. So huge, you know, a couple uh, dozens of miles of new walls have gone up. The bulldozers are in Texas at the National Butterfly Center at the, the nearby wildlife reserve. I think it's called the Santa Ana Wildlife Reserve. Uh -huh. They've already just knocked down huge acres, acres worth of trees and plants, and they're getting ready to build. So some of this is going to happen sooner rather than later. Uh -huh. um, there will be legal fights against it, undoubtedly. I think some of it will get blocked. Some of the funding will get blocked. It, I don't think we're going to get coast-to-coast -coast wall by the time Trump's gone, but we're going to get some damage. That's probably a good place to end. And you know, people can go and, and find out more about all of these issues on The Revelator. Um, yeah. John, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been great to have you. I'm glad that we've got a chance to talk face to face and me too um, we'll we'll stay tuned for what happens with the the trump border wall stay tuned <laughs> look out for those bulldozers all right well that's it for this show if you learn something be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons also we'd love to hear your comments and questions about this episode so don't hesitate to write one in the comments below thanks for watching and i'll see you next time mm -hmm.